Awesome. This looks great. I was hoping we were going to have people show up. <laughs> <laughs> so the doors open and they let people in. Yes. Uh, this is the uh, panel, workshop, whatever you want to call it, uh, building uh, inclusive communities online and offline. Um, so we're missing one person who is stuck in traffic due to an accident. So, But we're going to go ahead and sally forth and uh, hopefully she'll be able to make it safe and everybody else involved is safe. That would be fantastic. So I got uh, promoted five minutes ago. <laughs> Yay! Battlefield promotions. So, uh, so I have notes. So we'll, we'll kind of go through that and we'll just go freeform if that mm -hmm. helps. Um, so I guess we could start with intros and since I'm talking, mm -hmm. uh, I'm Donna Pryor, also known as Denicia online and I am a community manager. I've been in community management for eight years. I currently work for uh, NMAS Entertainment. We make Terra online and some mobile games. Uh, but I've worked on Star Wars The Old Republic. I've worked on uh, Guild Wars 2. I've worked on tons and tons of games. My hobbies, however, are working in tabletop gaming and I founded my own games convention called OrcaCon up in Seattle, which is an all-inclusive uh, tabletop convention. Um, and I've been running meetup groups um, since 2002 on meetup.com. So this is kind of my life, is doing this kind of thing. So go ahead. All right. Let you do your thing. Well, my name's Alan Patrick. I am the Associate Community Manager for the D&D Adventurers League. Uh, Wizards has been uh, really, really kind in uh, how they've allowed us to sort of grow and develop in different directions than maybe what we've seen previously. Uh, together, Robert Aducci and I have, have done everything we can to, to push uh, to, to push conventions uh, around specifically around the US but around the world when possible to be uh, a, a little more open in what they want to see in their in, in their communities and what they want from their gamers and organizers uh, I've, I've had good fortune of working with some really really impressive people and uh, it's pretty humbling most days I'm Sean Howell. I'm the CEO of Hornet. Uh, if you don't know what that is, that's an 8 million user gay social network. I grew up uh, gaming. I grew up running a BBS out of my house um, and calling other BBSs and using um, acoustical modems to do, to do that. And so uh, online gaming has been a big part of my life. And a big part of uh, many people's coming out experience. Some of the first people that they meet online um, are through gaming. Uh, and you get to be your own unique person uh, through gaming and sometimes live the reality that you want to live elsewhere. Um, but uh, in running a gay social network, uh, you can imagine people are always well behaved. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so no matter, even if we're a group of all like-minded people, um, sometimes the power that exists online also empowers um, some, some things that aren't always kind. So. I think, uh, I think that will be pretty easy for us to kind of talk about the steps uh, we, we take to make that safer, uh, the shortcomings that uh, might always exist, and then maybe uh, um, how we can continue to work on that. Awesome. Cool. Um, so first, I, I've been doing this panel mostly from an offline point of view, trying to get people face to face. Um, but one of the things that's been really good, whether I'm doing a community manager, you know, like video games or tabletop, is how many people here are actually community organizers? A couple of them. How many people would like to be community organizers? And how many people want to find safe spaces and how to, how to navigate and find them? Awesome. So we've got a good, good. good cross-section here. Um, so uh, we'll start with um, you know the creating groups from the or, or if you ha already have um, groups um, in creating trying to create a group is that the first thing that you have to do, especially if you're doing it online and offline, like you 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 went to electronic space, you went to a BBS, you could make it your own. Um, if you're doing it in person, it can be a little bit more difficult because you have to navigate locations. You have to ha try to get people to show up for your events. And uh, then you also have to be um, you know, ready to uh, set rules and boundaries in case people are not cool. 
Um, the difference here is that this is completely different than when I'm talking to a straight white dudes over the age of 35 kind of thing about how to make it more diverse. But there's still a lot of diversity that needs to be uh, brought in to groups such as race and accessibility. And accessibility is a huge thing that we need to be better at. So I think that even if you already know what you're doing, is that how do you make your uh, spaces more diverse? And um, as a D&D player, I started playing D&D in 80, seven, well after high school and all that stuff. And everywhere I went, everybody told me girls don't play D&D. &D. So, you know, for you, how do you, how do you uh, ch try to change that perception? Uh, what, that is actually a, a big challenge for us is, you know, where do we want to go with our player base? And ultimately, the answer is very, very short. I want players. I want people to come out and show up at an event and throw dice around. I want us to all get together, regardless of wherever it is we're coming from, for the same reasons. We're throwing dice, we're telling really dumb jokes, and we're having a great time doing it. Uh, to that end, I've, uh, I'll, I'll use my own store as an example. Uh, I, I own a small store in the middle of Michigan. Our, uh, our, our population in the village is very, very small, under 2,700 full-time residents. And in that, uh, in that area, which is not close to Detroit, it's not close to Lansing, there's no major urban center. We have a table of almost exclusively uh, female gamers. We have uh, folks that come out from suburban Detroit every now and again for some of our D&D, some of our Pathfinder events that maybe don't find the same acceptance elsewhere. Because my, uh, my business partner and I have worked with our regular gamers in our vision, and that is we want people to come together and throw dice. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter to us who's sitting at the table, as long as we have people sitting together. And it's that uh, the, the community that we want to see, we need to live that, and we need to preach that to the people that come in. And that same thing extends into how we want the Adventurers League to grow. So when I work with my other global admins and I work with my regional coordinators to set up, uh, you know, to help new stores set up their recurring game days or to set up new convention spaces, we help them reach out and ask themselves and ultimately ask the people that are running those larger events, what sort of event do we want to run? And that helps us build a better identity of where we're going to go. You have the same structures when you're setting up something that's online. Yeah, I, I would say one interesting challenge, and in, in I think maybe in Michigan it, it works out really nice because people in the Midwest tend to be nice to each other. But, <laughs> you know, you get one bad egg in a group and it can really yes. throw off whatever you're trying to build and make it awful. And then what do you do with that um, one bag, bad egg? And I think, you know, uh, a gentle touch can often be uh, a strategy that we, w we use um, because uh, for a lot of reasons. One, it's really easy to make a small problem into a big problem, and there's nothing uh, worse than scorning someone because they'll come back 10 times worse. Uh, and so a gentle touch is the strategy we often use, and then having an actual process that you, you take people through, um, and that's the, that's the best way to deal with it. And I think any time you continue to grow a community, and the wider your community is, then uh, the potential for conflict just continues to mm. um, expand. Yeah, like the, the, you know, when you have like what you're doing and then what I do and what you do, and it's, you know, I'm kind of doing a blending of online and offline kind mm. of things. Yay! Hi, I'm Woo! Hello. <laughs> <laughs> you made it. <laughs> Yeah, we have these little tables and we're trying to <laughs> all cooch in. Go ahead and tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Robin. Really sorry I'm late, not used to traffic here. Um, I am the founder of Her, and Her is an app for female and non binary gendered people to meet each other. Um, we're more of a social network with elements of dating underneath it. <laughs> I think one of the things that probably for you in your online space and then also with us with our offline space and then, of course, mine in the middle, is um, the number one thing to do is, is you create your space and then set your boundaries and then you set your rules. So uh, for you folks in what you do, because it's all online, how do you take that approach to making it a safe space for people? You, you yeah, so, we, like, uh, so when we started... Um, uh, we had to make very clear definitions about gender, um, and that was because there are so many other spaces where 
um, uh, lesbian or queer women will go and the spaces will be invaded by other people and it sometimes ruins the experience. So um, we, when I first started, um, we made it just for female identified users um, and then I think realized quite quickly that there was another community that should be as part of our space and so we then opened it up to non-binary gendered people um, but that was kind of like one of the first rules that we set about who this was for and what you would come for to look for it. Um, uh, and then when you're inside it, we have community guidelines that kind of set like how you should behave and, uh, and what we're up for and what we're not up for. Um, and to be honest, I think we still learn like every week things that like should or shouldn't go inside of it. Um, and it's kind of based on what makes people feel comfortable inside of the community. Like, after a period of time, it takes on a life of itself, and it's not down to us as much to set the rules as down to everyone else to decide what they want to see there and what they don't. Yeah, I think so. You can, uh, fr from a top-down level, as an organizer, what we do is we have messaging about who we want to be, and then that actually builds a self-sustaining community the most. And then we kind of empower our users to take things into their own hands so they can report and flag other, other users. Yeah, I think one of the things, because ours is in person, so we have to deal with, it's much easier to ban somebody online you know, and to set those boundaries, but when somebody's right there in front of you and you have to confront them, when you have somebody who, um, uh, you know, who's at your, uh, who's disrupting at an event because people don't like confrontation. Um, but when you set good rules and guidelines, uh, like as an example, I run a, a group called Inclusive Geekery. And we do things, we do a regular board game night, but sometimes we go to Theo Chocolate and do chocolate tier tours. We go to the cidery and have cidery. We go to the library, we do craft days and all this stuff. And every one of my organizers is basically given the tools and language to use. And one of the things we do with our thing, is our game night, is that this is open for everyone. I don't want to have other people have that feeling that they're not welcome in a space. Like when I was growing up and, you know, girls don't play D&D, girls don't play strategy games, women can't understand strategy, which is BS. And, uh, yeah, I did that when I went to go play tabletop miniatures. You know, everywhere there was no women in the space. And then one company was just like, well, of course you can. Why not mm -hmm. do this? I got a great game. Here, play my game. And... Um, so you have to be able to set that and, and set the boundaries and support your people. And as example, I had a guy who, um, I set up my meetup group, these people was like, oh my gosh, you know, I keep trying to go to these other meetups and there's always that guy. The one who, if anybody here plays Settlers? I hate that game. I <laughs> freaking hate that game, you know why? Because I got steamrolled, I didn't get taught how to play. And I've been playing games for a million years, and it was such a bad experience. And that's what most people experience who are not people who already play tabletop games. And so there's this guy, because nobody would confront him, chased away all these people. Okay. Of course, that means I got him, which was great. But he then showed up at my meetup. And everybody was all like, well, that's that guy, that's that guy, that's that guy we told you about. And he started throwing a fit that we were having beers, that we were having fun and socializing and getting to know each other, and that we weren't playing hardcore like he wanted. But I said very upfront, this is a newbie friendly, this is a queer friendly, we don't use, you know, we don't use bad language. I don't care, you can say fuck all day you want. I don't care, say that all day. But you're not going around saying, oh, that's gay. You know, and things like that. And so, um, so basically, right in front of everybody, I told them, I was like, you could just leave. And so the community at that point felt more empowered to uh, do that themselves because I was going to have their back as a community leader. So that's something that's really important. That's what you do. I mean, that's what you do because you'll yeah. get a toxic GM. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, it, as I said, as I was uh, developing our, our store and our local crowd, we've had to do that exact thing a number of times where, uh, you know, maybe I've got a player that maybe they've traveled in or maybe they're just new to the area. But if they're an aggressive gamer, if they're a disrespectful gamer, that's not the environment that we're building. And we need to make it a point to pull that person aside and respectfully inform them that this isn't the community that we're trying to build and clearly establish what sort of community we have without hemming and hawing and hinting at things, if we can effectively lay out what our expectations are, 
we do find that people will respond uh, positively. Yeah. It works well. Yeah, I, you know, I think the, the, there's the positive reinforcement, and, and you know, and this is from video games, is that you know, the, the way I look at it is that there's a bunch of really unhappy people in this world, and they are starved for love and attention. And unfortunately, they don't know how to express themselves. And so they express themselves in very bad ways. And it's very, very easy to do in the digital space. So, you know, it's just like, how do you handle um, when you have those people? How do you turn them around? And can you turn everyone around? Yeah, I, I think a lot of people, far more people have bad days than you think. Um, <laughs> And the number of people who might report um, an average user, um, not, not necessarily because everyone's actually having bad days, but because um, we're all human and it, we actually can take offense to things pretty easily. And the more multicultural you are, so we're 8 million users, our biggest countries are France, Russia, Turkey, Taiwan, Thailand and Brazil, so really different place in Russia. So really different environments, really different customs. Some places it's really easy to talk about weight, and oh my God, someone tells me something about my weight, I'm going to probably be upset. So um, uh, it's really easy for uh, people to uh, not just to understand, not just to think that uh, they don't have an impact, but be completely unaware. And so in, in our world, we actually have endless coaching. Like uh, we probably have 40,000 reported users a day that require individual responses. Um, so it, to do, to, you know, the one bad guy, like the bigger you get, the more that that happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's, you know, you have to form, the bigger you are, the more formal you have to make it, the more that you have to rely on empowering the community. So, you know, if he's so bad you need to kick him out, you have to kick him out early. Those are some Just of the ways. Everyone gets pissed off, like, uh, about everything. Yeah. Like, oh, uh, you would not believe how many times people get reported in our app for having bad eyebrows. Not even thinking, that's like a legitimate reason they report and they're like, bad eyebrows. And you're like, really? Is this happening? But, <laughs> What's crazy is like what actually makes the rules of what uh, what is bad and what isn't because some people will use a lot of swear words and uh, I'm kind of okay with that. I think that's fine. But then it's like the context that they use them around and exactly mm. as you say, people from different places take offense to different things. And I think what's really, when, when you like handle one of these cases, you kind of don't want to boot someone out for doing something that one other person thought was offensive and actually you could maybe kind of rectify the situation because especially having an LGBT space, there aren't that many other options. Like there are other options, but you kind of built this place in the first place so that everyone did have a place to come to. So it's that balance of making it so that it does feel open and safe and supportive, um, but also not just getting rid of someone at the first signs of saying something or having bad eyebrows. We have a, a, I've got a funny story kind of about that that you'll probably appreciate is I was working on a game and there's a, a welcome a welcome section where new people can come in and give introductions and this guy from Wales came in and so the people from Scotland Ireland and England they all started taking the piss at each other and they were just getting and so normally we would kind of remove that stuff but if you understand the cultural yeah. they're all making fun of each other because that's what they do up there is that everybody's making fun and all it did is have one American guy come in and go, America, fuck yeah! <laughs> and then everybody turned on him, and then he started crying about it. <laughs> I was like, well, look what you started. So, <laughs> so they're just giving him a hard time like they would give each other. So sometimes yeah. understanding the cultural impact yeah. of how you communicate and having to take that person aside and just say, oh, honey, don't come here again. <laughs> Stay over to the American threads. This, this may not be for you. <laughs> this may not be for you. <laughs> Awesome. So um, how do you, now this is something, especially in tabletop, yes. how do you go after and try to bring more diversity into your store? Uh, a lot of that comes down to making ourselves physically present and uh, really broadcasting what it is that we want to, uh, what we want to see at our tables. So if we want to see a, a, a wider range of gamer or a different type of gamer at our table, uh, you know, I, I've suggested with my, my regional coordinators, my local coordinators, the other admins, uh, going into our local facilities and actually saying, hey, if, you, if we want to have more female gamers show up at our tables, 
let's work with those store owners and say, you know, we want to run a, say, a, a ladies D and D night, and why should it be for people who identify that way or people who who just want to attend or watch? What is the incentive for that? Um, if we want to just have a, a house packed full of people, if we want to just run, you know, table, 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 you know, working with those store organizers to to figure out why that's important and not just important for for them, but why it's important for for those gamers to all be present at one time. Why should we have a table of, uh, you know, just teenagers, or why should we have a table of just kids, or just uh, stay-at-home moms? Why why should we target certain audiences? Uh, that's it, it compels people to think about uh, topics that maybe they haven't really associated with gaming in the past and it actually opens a lot of doors yeah yeah it's um, there's a group called I don't know if any of you heard, play magic um, it's called Lady Planeswalkers and it mm -hmm. was started by my friend Tifa Nobles uh, Tifa Robles in um, Seattle and so there's 50 chapters now and they go into game stores because magic um, is known for its misogynistic, um, downright, some stores mean people that play in it. And um, there's also a lot of toxicity uh, in uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! And so there's a lot of game stores that are just like, hey, there's a lot of kids play here and are excited and don't come in here and be an asshole, that they will block people from that because they want to create safe spaces. Mm -hmm. But the Lady Planeswalkers is doing that. It's set up, anybody can play with them, but it's specifically set out to encourage more women in the game store. And when I was growing up, and I was a cute little young hot thing, you know, like 25 years ago, um, it was either just like, oh, you're just somebody's girlfriend or brother or sister or whatever mm -hmm. and uh, or it was like right eh, <laughs> you know kind of thing so we don't want that in no. our stores and no, no, so no. you know uh, but that's a different kind of thing for you because you have very specific you know you have a very specific product and space to try to bring people in how do you go out and find new like I had never heard of your site before so it's like how do you find how do you go out and find more people to join Sure. So, uh, um, Rob, Robin's here because we, we, we carry each part of the burden of gay world, which is actually a much harder uh, market to keep happy than you might think. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, so, I, 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 th I think there's some neat things that just have happened in the last you know, decade that I've been um, out as a gay man, and technology has existed, and you know, I, um, you know, when when I would I would meet gay gamers online uh, back in dial-up days, but it would come out later, and then probably when I was in college, I saw that people were um, playing. Um, uh, Final Fantasy and, and putting in their that they were gay as like their name characters and now we have like a gay gaming conference that's not like in my garage it's like <laughs> at the convention center in San Jose and has real corporate sponsors who are dying to be corporate sponsors and um, and you know gender neutral uh, pronouns like so much is changing so quickly and it's there's all these fun things that allow more and more diverse communities to more easily get together so like if you're into you know like you're um, you know some kind of niche board game that's from you know 17th century France you can probably find another queer gamer who's mm -hmm. who's into that and all these all these things exist but um, uh, you know, running a gay company does not make me a diversity expert. In, in fact, probably um, being a gay man <laughs> is a hindrance in some ways to um, uh, being more aware. And so, the one thing I would tell you, if you're like, if you came to this panel because you were interested in this topic, you probably are representing something that's even more niche than even just this conference, the idea of this conference. And so the more we write about it and talk about it, the more all of us um, learn. And um, I think I'm in a space that's constantly learning, And um, but we're never gonna do it right, we're never gonna be inclusive enough, um, but we wanna keep trying to be. I think we found like when I started, I was like in London, I'd been like going to my lesbian bars and clubs and a bit of online dating. And that was kind of the only like lesbian world that I knew. And then you're on a product where 
you're trying to get millions and millions of women into a space and you're like, ah, where are they all? Like, it's been a really long conversation for a long time. You're like, really, where are the lesbians? And Because uh, <laughs> uh, like, you see gay guys in bars and you're like, they must be out there somewhere. <laughs> but it's like, they're, they're just super fragmented in these like tiny little pockets everywhere and really dispersed. And that's, if you want to get good, diverse um, uh, coverage and, and be an open space for everyone, you have to proactively go out and put yourselves into those spaces. And uh, it takes a lot of consideration. And when you're starting the company, it's so easy for that not to be a consideration because you're just trying to like survive until the next month. And there were honestly some fortunate good decisions that we made that were kind of targeting a bunch of different demographics. I think we're still way too um, youth focused. Like the majority of our users are 18 to 26 and I don't think we're good enough on the kind of like older end of ages, but the like great like kind of racial, ethnic, religious diversity inside of the app, which is awesome. Um, but we, went to lots of different like sports teams and um, we went to loads of roller derby clubs and just because that was the only things that we could think of at the time but then it ended up seeding the community really well which then grew from there and I think people forget that the early it is those like nonsense days of it are so important because that is literally where it sprouts from and if you take better care at the beginning it will make it much more diverse after a while. Yeah. I've got a funny story about you know trying to go places. How, have you, how many of y'all have heard of Geek Girl Con? Anyway, so it's a you know it's a female identified uh, geek gamer convention in Seattle, and it's fabulous. But the very first meeting with the three of us there is that one of the gals who came with the idea from going to a convention here in California, I knew I was not the right person for the group when she said, "And we should do a panel and have a bunch of guys on it talking about how much they like geek girls." <laughs> 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 so I was like, "This is not the direction I would think for a." a a woman empowered you know <laughs> event should be and luckily it's it's a really really great uh, safe sp space at this time but yeah it's just like where do we go where where do we go to find people but if all we're finding is people who have internalized misogyny themselves you know it's like how do you go out and get uh, past that yeah hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I think the biggest thing that, that I can say at that point is just we have to admit that we don't know everything, right? Uh, as we talk about wanting to build community, we, we have to be ready to admit that some communities are going to be a little differently geared than what we maybe expect or something uh, maybe not totally in sync with what we can build at this time. Uh, it, as you said, sometimes people will have internalized a lot of those things. Uh, as, as we go to, to build and we, we want to bring more people into the fold, we we want to have that safe space, but at the same time, you don't want to take that person who's internalized those things for so many years and tell them, you're not welcome here. Not without explaining why, not without explaining how they can become a part of this community. Giving people the time of day, giving them the respect that, that you want to see in that community is step number one. Yeah, it, the, you know, the, it's interesting on the learning aspect. Even when I, I was at uh, PAX, doing a panel about women in tabletop games. And we were talking about the difficulties as women who worked in tabletop and who are GMs who play tabletop and how difficult that can be um, with some of the really, really terrible grognard behavior of some of the, the guys. And so we were talking about how to handle creepy behavior. And I kept referring to somebody as a creep. And, call it, and so I got called on it by a panelist. It's like, you know, it's you shouldn't call somebody a creep because sometimes, you know, sometimes it's on purpose and sometimes it isn't. And, you know, it could be that somebody just doesn't know. So you call out the behavior versus telling somebody that they're, you know, oh, you're just a creeper because then you get the defensive versus, right. you know, you, um, you should ask before you hug someone. You know, even if you hugged them last week because they asked you for a hug, don't assume you can hug them each time. So, um, you know, a lot of that is also building your community is constantly reinforcing, mm -hmm. um, you know, the positive behaviors and, and what's not appropriate without just basically, unless somebody is like super terrible, like I run this video games, is like, why don't you just go kill yourself? You know, instant ban, instant ban, and, the, and I do it publicly so the community sees it. That's not acceptable behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm always saying debate the topic, don't name call the person, don't make it personal. Behavior can be fixed. People, uh, people are always going to be an ongoing thing. Yeah. It, I think there's also different communities. Like sometimes people want to be in a community that's not safe and that um, uh, 
you know, you can may maybe make some safeguards for that, but there's also, um, uh, um, you know, you're building your community the way that you want it, and you might be mindful that, you know, um, uh, um, some people aren't gonna be right for it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was involved in an organization that wanted to bring, uh, we want to bring true diversity um, with women and go after people and, and careers and jobs and all this stuff. And I said, well, look, they have all these cultural festivals in Seattle. So there's one that's uh, uh, Latina, uh, Latinas in technology. And it was supposed to, it was mostly, you know, to promote high school girls and STEM, you know, Latina high school girls and STEM. And they're like, why would we ever want to do that? We're a geek convention. Why would you not want to be there? You know, that's what, that's what you're supposed to be doing is going after this stuff. So sometimes you have to think, um, there, uh, this wonderful person I know named uh, Jen Frank wrote a thing about um, the, you know, like when you're starting out and things like that is, um, uh, what is she called, the Rolodex theory, is that you start with the people that you know. And, that, mm -hmm. and this happens in conferences with um, game developers conference, technical conferences, it's all a bunch of like straight white dudes. Right, that's all you see. There was a big thing with the game developer awards that were going on with Spike, is there was like one woman judge out of all of those. With all the women that make games, you know, you couldn't find it. So that meant all of the games were really brotastic games that were all being awarded, and nobody was really, you know, looking at Gone Home and all these really amazing narrative stories and things, and and looking at racially diverse uh, game developers and you know accessible games and things like that. So uh, you have to expand your Rolodex when you're starting to build your groups. And when you have your groups, if you really want to be more diverse, you have to go out and look for those. Right now, my, my convention for 2.0 is going to be focused on race and accessibility and tabletop games. So I'm going out to find the people who make games, you know, the people of color who make games, who make art, and bring them to my convention. That's my job as a leader is to go out and find the people, not, for ever, not to sit back and let everybody educate me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to think how to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I get really passionate about it. I can't help myself. Uh, well, I think our, our content creators are just as big a part of our community as, as our, our dice throwers and role players and card floppers and whatever other title you might want to assign out there. Uh, I've, I've worked with a, a, a lot of very interesting people and the way we've done our collaboration is almost exclusively exclusively digital. So a lot of these folks, all I have is a name, and those those names, you don't really know what to expect. Uh, you just get to know them for their body of work, and ultimately, that's. I mean, it, as someone who's partially in charge of organized play for a publisher, that's what I want to see. I want to see people get excited about a product, not associating a name with a, a perceived racial history or cultural history or. Or any of that. It doesn't really matter if someone's name is Bob or Dan or Susan or anything else, really. Uh, get to know them for their, their results, not because of what you think they, they might bring to the table. Did you have something to bounce off? No, but I bet there's some hot questions in there. There is. I was just like, I was like oh, we got some time. Does anybody have any questions? Um, you were talking about Russia earlier. How do you build a Yeah, it's a fantastic question, comes up a lot, um, and we've dealt with it in a lot of uh, ways. It's probably one of the funniest things I can talk about. Uh, so uh, we, we have number one market share in Russia, um, and Moscow actually happens to be, I suspect, the gayest city in the entire world. We have like 100,000 men online in a day. Like, it's just, it's so gay. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and they're, they're like guys in London. They just don't go to sleep. So they're just online all the time. Um, and so, you know, I, I went to St. Petersburg with the State Department when the first ban on um, propaganda was coming out. And then, then we saw it was going to become a federal uh, law in Russia, and then it, it expanded to like 11 countries in the region. And so we were really concerned, and we were uh, having cons uh, consulting with experts, and we were sending people messages, like uh, some best practices on how to say safe, because Vice made a documentary about people getting hurt in, in Russia, which, which does happen. 
um, but we're sending this to our users, and they they kind of emphatically wrote back, uh, <laughs> "We're not stupid." Um, and so, um, uh, so we we did all those things. Um, the situation in Russia isn't going to look better, but one one thing that is true, whether it's online gaming here in the US or bullying or anything, when people get together, it's powerful. And we work really hard to keep uh, bringing people together. And in Turkey, all of my competitors got shut out of the country and we work really hard to stay there. And we do, it's a technology solution, not a diplomatic one. <laughs> So I know about it in the Guy apps. I was like, because a lot of the Guy apps you can filter by ethnicity, which um, you can't do. And I was like, we have this like um, feed space where people post comments and questions. I don't know if it's the right solution at the moment because it's the early days. If people are posting about racial preference, we're deleting it for the minute um, because I think we don't know what our stance on it should be yet because it's not a filterable option. And it's girls saying like, why are all these white girls hitting me up? Or um, uh, I don't want to, I'm just not attracted to black girls. And then it causes like a huge like debate that comes off the back of it because people talk about, well, is that just your preference or is it? And at the moment, um, uh, the only, it, this is like when you're talking about what sets the rules and what doesn't, like we say we want to have open conversation and open community and then deciding well, what is an open conversation and what should or shouldn't be discussed. We took down that post because there were some uh, like really negative opinions coming out of it. And so I think at the moment we won't be introducing any racial filters. Um, uh, and uh, I don't think we won't allow any discussions that start talking about racial preference inside of the app. Yeah, we talk of, about ourselves as the nicer gay app. So just by doing that, that helps. Um, and there's not great technology solutions. There's like brute force technology solutions. So when people write something offensive, and we can't automate it that well, we rely on, uh, we do automate it, but um, there's so many languages and it's really hard to do. But it's a, it's a, it, it is a battle that has not been won yet. So there's, there's conflict and we work hard to, to not allow people to show their racism. Yeah, it's, go ahead. <laughs> hmm? Go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm good. So in regards to, uh, I believe it was mentioned earlier, where the bigger you become, the more informal policing becomes, and the way you have to rely on empowering your community, yes. what are some ways that you can actually empower your community to ensure that they'll do what you're looking for, at least to a degree where you'll be satisfied with some kind of result? Well, you know, I was like, especially f like for my day job, and you know, for what I do is that, you know, is first of all, are you paying people? If they're paid, that's really easy. That's really easy to do because here's your rules, follow it, or your money's a huge motivator. Your <laughs> money is a huge <laughs> motivator for people to, uh, you know, uh, do that right. Um, lead by example is the best thing that you can do. And you know, when you when you're working with volunteers, you're working with people in the community. You know, like um, I was talking about this on coming out in the games industry panel earlier is um, I just recently started working at NMAS. And um, so I got on there and I actually face more issues because, you know, I, I have a lot of privilege, you know, because, you know, I look straight, I'm, I'm older, you know, people think I'm somebody's mom and I'm not. And um, so, you know, everybody was in there. I have, when I go from game to game to game to work on, I have a, a core group of community members that follow me no matter what project I'm doing. If just when I get there, because they want to see that positive stuff in the community. And so coming in, um, I had a bunch of people come in and they're just like, well, you're fat, you're ugly, you're old, why are you here? You know, women don't play video games, you don't know what you're talking about and all this. So the community was in there and the community didn't put up with it. 
And so the, the great thing was, is, you know, that I have kind of had preceded community of people that um, I'll go play a game and I use the same handle. And they're like, oh, you were the community for manager for such and such game. And I felt very safe there. I appreciate that. So, you know, a lot of that, it's all relationship building is the best way to do that. And um, when you stand up, the, the, the easiest thing for me to do as a community manager is on a forum is when somebody says something is stand up for that person and say, this person is correct, this person is right, thank you so much, you did a great job. And when you empower those people, we call the, the people who do that, we call them the common sense brigade versus everybody that's like, ah, on the internet. <laughs> that's what we call them when they do that. Um, and so when you reward that good behavior, um, then the community will start doing it themselves. And they will, then you don't have to jump in there and, and do anything for that. Something that Robert and I do, Robert is the other community manager for the Adventures League. Uh, every month we touch base with our regional coordinators as well as our local coordinators. And we ask them what's, what's new and different, what's exciting, what is special going on in your markets. And we'll, go, we'll make it a point to bring up some, some more of these perceived hot button topics. Because what we found is the more we talk about it, the less of a hot button issue it becomes. Other people are more comfortable discussing it because they know that we are as well and that spreads out into their peers. The more we peel back the curtain, the more accessible all of that actually becomes. Transparency. Mm -hmm. That's the right thing. Yeah, we use similar similar processes that any big game gaming institution uses. So it's really similar. Any other questions? Anybody else? Um, so when you look at very competitive or esports games, for example, League of Legends, they tend to have very toxic communities. Yes. As soon as publishers stop paying those people, it can change. Paying but the, and pay, paying the people and the people the, until until the publishers stop paying for this behavior because they're paying people to be toxic. And until they uh, and, and Riot is bless their hearts, Riot. I mean, League of Legends is so huge, but they are constantly working, you know, with sociologists and, you know, all kinds of stuff to try to, and they take away, they start taking away privileges and things like that. But really, until people stop rewarding that kind of toxic behavior, and, um, you know, and a lot of that's also tied into the same thing of technology with bro culture, you know, uh, and rape culture and all those other things. Once people put their foot down and don't tolerate it, um, then things will change. We should always have a mission statement, even if it's you know one sentence. You know, my mission statement. Uh, you know, anything I do boils down to teal deer, be excellent to each other. Um, yeah, Bill and Ted for the win. Yep. <laughs> I have a lot of things to say about their movies, but uh, but that that message right there is amazing. You know. I don't know if that answered your question completely, but but yeah, by having a core group of people. We have like a, we have our, print, and we basically just kind of written them because we were doing it a bit off the cuff before of like, do we think that's right? Do I not think that's right? And now it's got to a stage where it's just super helpful to have them so you don't make those random decisions. And as you get more people on your team, like we've got more moderators now, and so they need to know what's in and what's out. And so it's kind of a weird thing as well to pick because it's always this balance between what you want as the creators of the original community and then kind of what the communities become and what you think is the right thing for the community and honestly I don't know where that balance always sits like between the world that we want to see and create and make sure it is inclusive but also how everyone behaves underneath it so I think you can have these like big broad principles um, uh, but then we also have like specifics that sit underneath it because of things that have come up that like for us we always have to say we 
you cannot ask for threesomes in this space, which seems, again, like weird and very specific, but uh, it happens so often in female spaces with women um, who have boyfriends who come here seeking their unicorn, and uh, it uh, ruins it for a lot of people. And we're like, no, go to OkCupid okay or Thrinder, like they're great for those things. But so overarching principles and then specifics has worked so far for us. When you're, when you're making something bigger, you actually, can wash out some of the diversity that you're creating. Like, just think about how much uh, the LGBT space has changed. Um, you know, the, the sense of suffering solidarity used to be so much. Like, if I if we just saw another gay person on the street, they were like my best friend. If someone said something bad about them, uh, you know, I was right at their side. And so that's you know, it's why it's so fun to get to come to Gamer Access because it's like so. It's like the net, more niche you are, the more power and potent that flavor of diversity is. Um, and so as we got bigger, you know, things things changed and we, we you know, we're at 8 million users now and we're doing things to help people find their little niche things. So we launched hashtags recently. We made one for GamerX. You can mm -hmm. try to find other people here who put that in their profile. Um, and we'll continue to do that. You know, I think the, the, the um, and you'll see a bigger rise of that in the LGBT space. I think the niche communities will empower themselves. Like you look at something like Folsom, like the, the, more, the more specific and flavorful something is, I think we're at a time when those things will shine. Um, so being, being big some, in some ways means no flavor. Yeah, it, you know, the, the importance of rules, even if you're running a meetup group, you know, on meetup.com or something like that is, you know, as an example, I took a bunch of, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things out there for cons and events about making safe spaces and rules and things like that. And so I, I ga gathered a bunch from the Geek Feminism Wiki and then kind of changed it up for my own purposes. Um, but I have a very modified, smaller version of that in my meetup group. So when somebody signs up, I make them fill out the form. And if they just put dot, 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 you know, it's like, no, 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 I want to see that you're a real person. And when somebody says, you know, oh, I want to join this because I want to meet, uh, you know, girl gamers, I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, nope, nope. But everybody that gets accepted in their email says, these are our rules, this is what we tolerate, this is what we won't, this is, this is our mission statement about what is important with us. Please come on this journey with us. And so that kind of gives them the permission to also say, well, I saw this, but you know, because uh, I've had people tell me that, um, well, I didn't want to, this is, I didn't know if this is going to be cool for me to say or anything like that. I have, so, I get a lot of people that's like, I have some questions and I don't want to offend anybody. So I get that a lot. So when you can do that and take people into your journey, into what you're doing, what you're passionate about, um, then it lets people feel comfortable to do that. But having a mission statement and you know rules is absolutely the way to go. That's a powerful phrase to use as well. Is with us, you know, when you're you're setting up a new game of Catan. I know you hate Catan, but uh, <laughs> but you know if you're setting up Magic Catan or a backgammon game or whatever you're doing, it's come play with us. Here's where we are going to be using those inclusive terms. We'll get people to be just passively open to your point of view and the vision that you have for that, that group. Any other? Okay. Um, I have a specific piece of advice I'd like to solicit. Um, uh, the fighting game committee, guys, and two characters on screen fighting each other, is famously super toxic, right? It has a great reputation for being like the worst place on earth for anybody who's not a, a pro fighter. Um, a couple of years ago, we made Killer Instinct, and we got into that space. Uh, we were a very small team, and Microsoft didn't really support us hugely with like, a lot of community support. So we had to go out and do it ourselves. So it was like a handful of us that tried to run our forums and tried to go to events, tried to talk to people. And what we found was there was a really small minority of super toxic people. Everybody else was having a good time playing games, and people who played our games seemed to be having a good time without being dicks about it. Um, yep. In fact, we observed a lot of really desirable behavior where somebody would say something like, you totally raped that guy, and then somebody behind would like smack him in the head, like, that's not cool. Yep. Um, so we were like, no, this is good. Like, good yep. stuff is happening. But it, it appears that that never got telegraphed away from that community. Um, and so the community retains its toxic, horrible, horrible reputation. What do you do in that situation? Like, how would you go about evangelizing the good of that community? People who have already written it off as like, that's not for me, right? Yeah. Um, that's that's um, you know is is actually having a presence. Do you have a community manager? Uh, we had to give up the product unfortunately because we got 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, we're, we're bound to bump to something like that again in the future because several niches of video games genres have that, like the esports question earlier, right? Like that's, yep. people, that, people have a little bit of that now where they're like, oh, it's an esport, that's not for me, obviously, because the, the community will show up and I don't want to be part of that. Yep. So how do you, what do you do in that situation? Um, well, the, you know, that's where you have to sit down and have that conversation, you know, with your company. And so, as much as forum warriors don't believe this, the people who post on forums are actually this much of your community. Most people, everybody who works in game space knows this, is the and software, it doesn't matter. Most of your users are having a great time, or at least they're helping themselves, even if they're, you know, maybe they're not so happy. The ones who are really unhappy are never gonna say anything. They're just gonna drop off. And that's just in any industry, really, no matter where you are, is that that's why you have win back programs and things like that to try mm -hmm. to get people back and surveys. Um, but from when you're at that point, is basically you have to put the brakes on and just, uh, we had this on a game I worked on, uh, Pirates of Burning Sea, is that it was going this way and we didn't want it to go that way. So we put the brakes on, reset everything, I just, was really open and honest uh, that we are going to put our foot down, we are not tolerating this behavior anymore. The hard part is getting publisher and, and executives on board with that. Because there's, uh, okay, another one of my things is about community management in video games and why nobody takes us seriously about the benefit that we can bring to a company. And uh, people think that we post on forums and Twitter all day. And that's actually a very small part of what we do. But um, getting buyout from development, because a lot of developers don't see the value of it. They don't want to talk to people. They hate it. They don't want to be on live streams. They don't want to be in interviews. They just want to code. They want to design. They want to write. They don't understand customers at all. They don't understand any of the social behaviors. They just don't get it. Um, so, but you have to basically reset it, put your foot down. You have to have exec on board to be able to do this. You have to have your publisher on board to do it if you are not self-publishing. Um, and then you just get rid of people. You just start getting rid of them and just say that behavior is not, uh, not allowed, you're out. And people will rant and rave. They will come and do floods. We had, <laughs> we had this on the Old Republic. They have awesome, this thing on forums, which I hate, it's called visitor walls, can't moderate them properly. So they went in on a weekend when they knew there was no moderation and posted Star Wars porn on every single Bioware, EA, and LucasArts uh, employees' walls. Ugh. So all you saw was pornography. Some of it was beautiful. <laughs> Some of it was terrible. <laughs> I mean, I, and I got to look at hundreds and hundreds of pieces of porn all the time. And, um, There's a big difference between, ooh, Wookiees and oh, Wookiees. <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> Not that that's anything wrong with that, because it's, it's okay. It, you know, something is good for everyone. Rule 34. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's true. But, um, so we basically, you know, we turned off the forums. And we're just like, if you guys can't act like adults, you don't deserve this. And you start taking stuff away. When you have something that toxic, that's how you turn it around. One thing that we told is, our, our forums are actually surprisingly clean. Like, we, we yep. didn't tolerate any kind of crap. Um, we had a, a very strong line about personal attacks that we, we were absolutely hard on the female moderators on the forum that, that, were, that kept that side of the conversation alive without shutting down people. It, was, it, was, it seemed good on our end, but where things were going bad like everywhere else, like at tournaments that we weren't organizing, um, yep. that we would get associated with at, in, on Twitch with personalities that were really loud, that were perhaps toxic, that were playing our game, that again, we had nothing to do with, we didn't sponsor, yep. we didn't. Yeah, I mean, the hard, the hard part is, is that you have to fish or cut bait. Um, if you want to be esports, then, you know, that's true. That's the way we say it in, at work, at every job I've had, esports, is that um, you have to decide if you want to be a part of that greater community because until the money stops, it's just going to be that way. And all you can do is protect your own community and your own players and, um, you know, events that don't have, um, you know, rules of conduct and anti-harassment policies. You just don't go to those shows. You know, like PAX is a good example of, you know, developers, after Mike yet again opens his mouth here and there, people pull out and they're just like, we don't need this show because our players, you know, this is not a good space. So unfortunately, at this time, the only way to do it is just take care of what you have and Hopefully the people who are making the decisions for you to be in those spaces will say, you know what, we're not going to put, we don't put a pair of players in that. 
So you just don't do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a delicate balance, which is why I'm not a fan of volunteer moderators. Um, you know, uh, but there's jobs where I've had to have volunteer moderators, and you, it's really, really hard to go find the good ones. But there are a lot of really good people. Get them on board with your mission statement, and uh, and then go from there. Let me get them, and then you. Yeah, are you go? Okay, um, in my community back home, um, I actually started when I was 17 years old. Um, didn't have any sort of structure whatsoever. And now that I'm 21 years old, we have 250 numbers. How would you best suggest that we actually implement some form of structure? Because we've attempted to do it in the past, and it hasn't really been accepted very well. They want to kind of do it um, very free. But um, now being over 250 numbers, it needs to have a lot more structure. So, what would your guys' best course of action? Is this an online space? Uh, it's it's mostly offline. Yeah. Um, January first is coming up, and that's a great time to reset your rules. Yes. <laughs> The, the biggest thing I'd recommend to that is broadcast what your intentions are and keep it simple. If you want people to get together, as I said earlier, to just throw dice, then make that known to everybody. This is a space for everyone to get together to trade cards, to throw dice, to tell stories, whatever that, that happens to be, but keep it simple. And, you know, a lot of that also is um, do it from the heart. Uh, I guarantee I will be so excited and passionate about talking about building communities that I will cry at least three or four times this convention when I get all choked up about the amazing things people are doing. And, um, you know, first of all, why? Why is this important? And you tell it straight from the heart. You know, we want this to be a safe space. We want this to be a welcoming space. And we want to be here for you. And we want to be here for each other. You know, all the things that are values, what your values are and what you want from that space. If you are transparent with that and honest, and then you have to set your boundaries, they are going to be extremely hard. People are going to push them. And so uh, the easiest thing to do would just be bannernate them. But really, you need to spend some time, you know, talking to them about, you know, why this is important and their impact on other people. And sometimes, you know, if you can get any little bit of empathy going with people, um, you're winning. Discussing the behavior rather than the person. Yep. You know, what you said, you know, uh, words mean things and words are powerful. You know, sticks and stones, no. Words hurt. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when you can do it in that context, uh, like I was talking about before, you know, calling somebody a creeper, that's, that's not helpful. That's negative. Talking about this behavior seems creepy or can be construed as creepy. Let me help you with, through this situation. Girls don't like it when you touch them when they don't want to be touched. And sometimes you, somebody's just got to tell the dude, you know, tell a person that, you know, this makes people uncomfortable. You're a good person and I believe in you. And like, be a leader. Like, if you started it, this, you know, be there for like your people. You set up for them, and so say like, you know, we're here. We've heard from other people in the community that we need this because of this. We really want to involve you in this decision. They want to feel like they were part of it, and they built it together. And exactly as you said, talking about like the emotion and coming from you. Like, we made a change in the app, and we told the users about it, but then they were nuts and were like, ah, why would you do this? And and I hadn't been online for like 30 minutes and went back and was like, oh, shit. And then it just wrote a post being like, hey, we'd explained it. You know, we decided as a team based on what you guys had said, this is what we're doing. We can always change it. We want to hear your feedback. Thank you so much. 
and suddenly they're nice as pie and everyone's like oh I'm so sorry thanks so much this is great let's see how it goes <laughs> and just because I think because it came from us and it didn't it's not this like company or entity making a decision it's like it's you and you give your heart into building this community and you give up so much time and energy mm. and you're like I'm trying to do the best I can here help me with this and this is what we think we need awesome yep. well I guess we're done oh. awesome <laughs> yeah. so thank you for joining us